All right, everybody, you tuned in. The death is just around the corner, and we're, we're taking some calls. Call the one. What do you got for us? Hi. Yeah, so this is Tony from Philadelphia. And I just want to say it's friggin' ridiculous that you would do an entire episode on John F. Kennedy. You're talking about assassinations and heads getting blown up when you got, you're, you're working on a major motion picture about our Bud Dwyer, okay? And his head explosion was every bit as friggin' good as Kennedy's. And this is just another example of how the city of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania never get none of the friggin' respect that they deserve. And I'm so friggin' done with it, all right? All right, call the one. I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, history is history. The big dogs, you know, the big dogs, you got to let them out to play, and the little dogs have to wait their turn. Call the number two. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from the city of Boston. I already called three friggin' times already, okay? My name's Mikey, Ked, and here's the fucking thing, Ked. You do an entire episode about John F. Kennedy, and you don't hardly even talk about the fact that he's from friggin' Boston. Okay, everything about John Kennedy comes back to friggin' Boston, all right? Nothing about him makes any friggin' sense unless you got him, you know, in a line with all the great Boston boys. I mean, we're talking about, you know, who are we talking about? We're talking about a Sam Adams. We're talking about a David Ortiz. We're talking about... You know, those brave Sanayev boys that put us on the map. If you're going to talk about John Kennedy, Ken, you got to talk about John Kennedy from Boston. Well, uh, 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 you know, call it too. It's the uh, same thing as before. You know, I, I, I don't know what I can tell you because, you know, John Kennedy, he may come from Boston originally, but, you know, uh, now he belongs, uh, he belongs to the people, you know, especially now that he's uh, freaking sprayed all over him. So uh, uh, call number three. Where are you calling from? What you got to say? Hey, thanks for having me on your show. This is a uh, this is Rex from Belton, Missouri, and you know I've been a long time admirer, long time listener, and I, I found your your last episode uh, real interesting. You know, there's some real interesting stuff in there, but I gotta say, it kind of it kind of skimped out on what I felt like was the most important details. You're talking about the CIA, and you're talking about Cold War, you're talking about nuclear weapons, and you know. I guess all that's important, but, you know, as an American, first of all, you know, as a Missourian, you know, second of all, or maybe even, maybe even the other way around, what I got to know about this whole John Kennedy situation is basically this, is what are the Jews doing during all this? Because, you know, anything important that happens, I want to know, it's real important for me to know a lot, basically where were the Jews and what were the Jews up to? And I, and I just got to say, you know, even though I'm a fan of the show, I was a little bit disappointed you didn't have more about the Jews there. Well, uh, uh, caller number three, I hate to say it, but you're talking some sense. You know, I we all got our disagreements. We all got different things we think is important. You know, we try to we try to get the uh, address everybody's concerns here. But uh, I I I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're all the way right. I don't think you're all the way wrong either. So we're gonna have a talk with uh, our producers later and see what we can do to uh, b better represent your interests in the course of the show from now on. All right. Everybody, we are extremely goddamn back for episode 70, part two of this whole JFK thing. And I had hoped to uh, get through this material in an episode or two, but it's become clear there's so much information and it's so important that we need to do uh, probably a total of three or four. And I've tried to pattern these episodes, tried to build their their inner architecture such that the most important things would come up again and again and you would have a hard time forgetting them. But if you're the kind of person who likes to take notes, get a notebook out because there's a lot of information coming at you. Uh, now before we get started with the thing proper, just wanted to uh, uh, make a couple little prefatory announcements. The first to clarify why we're doing this at all. Because it is not, it is not in the vein of, you know, 
unsolved American murder mystery. Who killed JFK? You know, that's for people with fucking programming hours to fill on the History Channel. And it is most certainly fucking not to gild the lily of the the tragic grandeur of the beautiful but doomed Kennedy family, which is not just, you know, adolescent fatuity. It's actively pernicious in that it obscures the entire reason this thing fucking matters. And why does it matter? Well, uh, put it this way. There was, depending on how you count, about a year or a year and a half, the last year or year and a half of John Kennedy's presidency in which we as a nation and through us, the world, had the opportunity for some kind of future in which, uh, as, as Thomas Pynchon put it in Inherent Vice, the American fate might mercifully fail to transpire. This was our last shot. And the world since then, the world of endless war all over, endless imperial expansion, endless neoliberal austerity enforced by violence, endless American-backed dictatorships all over the world, you know, the hundreds of thousands dead in Central and South America, the hundreds of thousands of desaparecidos, no one knows if they're dead, the uh, four million killed in Vietnam, the no one knows how many million killed in Cambodia and Laos, the millions dead in various African quote-unquote civil wars, almost inevitably with CIA backing on one side or the other, and you can guess which kind of side the CIA took, um, plus the million dead in Iraq and the who knows how many dead in Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and Pakistan and Somalia, the entire order of things since then, this was our last chance to prevent that from happening. So Kennedy's assassination does not simply matter as some historical triviality or blot upon the national psyche, though it, it certainly matters as a blot upon the national psyche. I mean, I think that's part of why uh, people are so goddamn lazy about understanding its meaning. No, it, it matters because this was the last time somebody in a position of sufficient power had a glimpse of the real machinery of state, which is to say largely secret state, and to his everlasting credit, threw himself into the fucking gears. You know, John Kennedy, as we will be discussing, for most of his life, except for uh, a few very notable occasions, was basically a spineless fuck around. Uh, but on those few occasions, he outdid himself. And he knew perfectly well that he was going to die for what he had done. In fact, uh, before the, uh, the little campaign trip press junket that took him through Dallas, he actually told his wife that he thought he was going to die soon and started discussing political assassinations. And he said to her, you know how they do it, right? They would, uh, they would either have a shooter shoot from some kind of, you know, protected angle along a motorcade, or they would have someone come up to me with a gun in the crush of a big crowd. And there's John and there's Bobby. And uh, I don't know nearly as much about Bobby Kennedy's death, by the way, but from what I do know, it seems safe to say that if not absolutely certainly, then almost certainly the CIA was responsible for that too. Um, and that reminds me that I wanted to credit, before this goes any further, a guy named James W. Douglas, that's Douglas, Douglas with two S's, who wrote a book called uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, that is the single best source about all this. Uh, Douglas was an alumnus of the Catholic Worker, so you're going to have to sit through some ponderous-ass analogies between JFK and Thomas Merton, but trust me, it's worth it. You will learn a great deal there. And the other thing I wanted to say before we get started was just a correction of a couple errata from the previous episode, all having to do with Iran, incidentally. Uh, the first was my description of the Iranian political situation after the CIA coup in 1953. I said that uh, the Shah was installed after the CIA took out Mohammad Mossadegh. 
That's not exactly right. The Shah actually never lost power uh, during Mossadegh's presidency. He just lost a great deal of influence, but he, he was technically never anything but the Shah. The actual guy who replaced Mohammed Mossadegh was a general named Fazlullah Zahedi who implemented a horrifically authoritarian military regime. The other thing about Iran, uh, I had the dates of Iran contra a, a little bit too early. Uh, the Sandinistas took over Nicaragua in 1979. So that's when the, the program really kicked off. And uh, the Boland Amendment, uh, actually the first Boland Amendment, there were three of them, but the one prohibiting uh, American aid to the Contras in Nicaragua, that was 1982. So I, uh, I moved things back a few years, or up a few years, depending on how you think about it. Incidentally, and I promise this is the last piece of marginalia before we really get going. I feel it incumbent upon me to say something about Iran. Now, I am not one of those tankies who thinks that any foreign leader who has trouble with the United States is, by dint of that trouble, an anti-imperialist hero. Fuck that. Now, no one in the Kim family is good. Bashar al-Assad is a piece of shit. He's just better than any of the alternatives. And in the same way in Iran, Hassan, Hassan Rouhani, he fucking sucks. The Ayatollahs, they fucking suck. But these uh, so-called democratic protests uh, spontaneously arising, well, I got some doubts. Now, I'm not saying the Iranian people don't have plenty to be angry about. Angry at the Rouhani, angry at the Ayatollahs, angry in general. And I am not saying that these protests are completely false. They might mean 95% real. But when I see that, and this would be, I don't know, maybe six weeks or two months ago, when I see that Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo have created a special new CIA task force that will report directly to them and that will focus on activities in North Korea and Iran. And then I see that the architects of this new task force are Eric fucking Prince, professional mercenary, a uh, Christian apocalypticist, the CEO of what used to be called Blackwater and then was called Zay, I believe, XE, and is now called Academie. Um you know, a murderer for hire, and Oliver fucking North, the middleman in the whole Iran Contra thing. And uh, and then and then I see just today that Rex Tillerson has been kicked out and replaced at state by Mike Pompeo, uh, and that part of the reason for Tillerson's departure is apparently that Trump plans to name John Bolton his new national security advisor so that he will be entirely surrounded by anti-Iranian psychopaths like fucking General Kelly and God, Bolton. I mean, Bolton was one of the uh, major players in getting the Mujahideen e Khalq, the, you know, the MEK, the People's Mujahideen of Iran, uh, taken off the list of terrorist groups so that Americans could lobby for it again. Americans like Howard Dean, incidentally. Uh, when I see all of that coming together, and then this sudden wave of democratic, spontaneous protests in Iran, particularly when I see news outlets using photos and footage of other protests and claiming that they're happening in Iran. I God, I can't remember who it was, but some TV channel... Uh, putting up photos and playing film from the 2011 Bahrain protests and saying that they were protests for democracy in Iran, I get real, 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 real fucking suspicious because we've seen this kind of thing before. I mean, uh, if nothing else, I would hope the last episode about the CIA would have uh, encouraged you to look at a series of events like these with a bit more skepticism than, say, the 
arbiters of truth and justice at the New York Times and Washington Post are going to give them. So let's get into the show itself. All right, now. So what we're dealing with in this episode, who is this feller, John Kennedy, and why was he worth killing? What made him threatening? And in order to address that question, we're going to have to talk about Kennedy himself and his background, but I think we should start, rather, with the uh, the Washington that he inherited, particularly in the form of uh, foreign policy. Now, Dwight Eisenhower... Um, he will tend to be celebrated by some of your more credulous liberal types for having made that famous military-industrial complex speech. Well, Dwight Eisenhower was also one of the most two-faced, backstabbing sons of bitches in American history. And uh, a lot of the time, he was doing that backstabbing to Richard Nixon, so it was funny. But that uh, military-industrial complex speech was tremendously insincere on any number of levels. Uh, let's list them, shall we? This, this, this apparently aggrieved and concerned elegy for a state at risk of, you know, the acquisition of unwarranted influence, as he said, to the, uh, of the military-industrial complex, or rather by the military-industrial complex. The risk that, quoting here, public policy itself could become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Well, no shit, Dwight. Number one, uh, you knew that because it was under your presidency that the CIA assumed the dimensions of a secret government, thanks to Alan Dulles. Uh, number two, the day Ike made that goddamn speech, January 17th, 1961, three days before Kennedy's inauguration, uh, his CIA was having Patrice Lumumba murdered in the Congo. We're going to talk more about Lumumba later. And, um, you know, normally it's it's not necessarily safe to tie the actions of the CIA to the will of a given president, as Christ, as Kennedy well knew or would find out. But in this particular case, we have it on record that Eisenhower wanted the CIA to murder Lumumba. So as he's giving this speech, uh, we're taking out Patrice Lumumba half the world away. And the <laughs> perhaps... Uh, uh, greatest depth of insincerity uh, reached in this speech, or rather I should say constituted by the very existence of this speech, was a thing that had happened just about a year earlier. Uh, a thing called variously Operation 40 or Group 40. Group 40 were the people involved. Operation 40 was the thing, or rather the uh, umbrella term for a whole grouping of things. You see, in late 1959, our boy, Alan W. Dulles, head of the CIA, he had a little confab with uh, a CIA agent named Colonel J.C. King, uh, late 1959. Uh, King was the uh, CIA chief of Western Hemisphere operations at the time. He was one of the first organizers of the anti hakobo Arbenz coup in Guatemala, and he was eventually a point man on the coup in Brazil in 1964 that replaced, and how many times have we said this, the democratically elected socialist, João Goulart, with the militarist autocrat, uh, Castelo Branco. Uh, King called up Dulles, and you know this would be uh, not so very long after Fidel Castro uh, successfully took over Cuba and said, you know, we're doing great things. We did great things in, in Iran. We did great things in Guatemala. But we cannot allow communism to gain a foothold in the Western Hemisphere, much less 90 miles off our goddamn coast. We need to do something. And um, Dulles naturally agreed. So they talked to Eisenhower. And in March of 1960, Eisenhower convened this thing well, I should say first, convened this uh, study group, task force, called Group 40. 
And group 40 was basically going to deal with assassinations and invasions. Group 40 was the CIA kills your ass uh, top dogs. Um, as to the precise membership of group 40, oh God, if there's any document in American history I could see, it might be that one. Who was at the first meeting of group 40? Because uh, naturally they're not going to tell you. We do know a few specific names because they were official government representatives there. We know that Dulles was there. We know that Colonel J.C. King was there. We know that the uh, meeting was chaired by Richard Nixon, then the vice president. And we know that there were three advisors from the administration there. Uh, Admiral Arlie Burke, who was the chief of naval operations. Um, the phenomenally 50s old guy named Livingston T. Merchant, who was the state undersecretary for political affairs. And Gordon Gray, who was uh, Eisenhower's top national security advisor. As for the rest of Group 40, we can't say to an absolute certainty who they were. What we can do, however, is look at uh, all the various things that happened under the umbrella of Operation 40 and see the people who were in charge of them. And it is fair to surmise that these people, since you know they happened bang, bang right away, were almost certainly part of that initial Group of 40. So, folks, this is going to be a hit list of some of the great villains of the latter 20th century. And incidentally, this will also be the nucleus of the people who murdered John F. Kennedy. Kennedy's assassination comes absolutely straight line out of Group 40 and Operation 40. Number one on the hit parade. And if you remember no other CIA name other than Dulles, I guess, out of all of this. Remember this name, I beg you. David Atlee Phillips. That's Atlee, A-T-L-E-E. -E. David Atlee Phillips. Um, one of the more evil men in American history. Uh, it is also important to remember, this will come up later, that he used the uh, field code name Maurice Bishop. And wherever the CIA was doing evil shit, from about the mid-50s to the mid-70s. David Atlee Phillips was there. He was there in Guatemala in 1954. He personally walked the Guatemala City Station Chief uh, through the the coup that ousted Jacobo Arbenz and installed Carlos Castillo Armas. He was one of the planners of the Bay of Pigs. Uh, after the Bay of Pigs, he led an illegal and non-presidentially sanctioned anti-Cuban terrorist strike force called Alpha 66. We'll have a lot to say about Alpha 66, too. Uh, eventually, he became the chief of Western Hemisphere operations for the CIA, following up uh, Colonel J.C. King, the guy who called the meeting, and led what was called the Guerra Sucia in Mexico, the Dirty War, in which the uh, CIA and the Mexican PRI, if, I'm, if I've got this right, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, uh, they tortured and executed leftists to the tune of about uh, 1,200 disappearances, many of whom are presumably uh, dead, well, not just dead, murdered. Uh, David Atlee Phillips was in the Dominican Republic. After 30 years of military autocracy under a feller named uh, Rafael Trujillo, who had our backing, uh, the Dominicans elected uh, a leftist named Juan Bosch in 1963, and Phillips and LBJ got together to replace Bosch with a Trujillo puppet named Joaquin Balaguer. Uh, it took three years of civil war in which 3,000 people died, and then during Balaguer's presidency, uh, there were 11,000 more murders. Uh, David Atlee Phillips was there in the 1973 coup in Chile that replaced, hey, it's that magical phrase again, the democratically elected socialist Salvador Allende with uh, Generalissimo Augusto Pinochet, who killed uh, thousands of people. And uh, he was also directly involved in the 1976 assassination of a guy I mentioned last time named Orlando Letelier, uh, who was briefly a minister in um, Allende's socialist government. He was an economist and a leftist, 
And after the Pinochet coup, he came to the United States and was an active and vocal opponent of the Pinochet regime, especially the economics of the Pinochet regime, because as some of you probably know, uh, the University of Chicago and its evil fuck of a, an imminence crise, Milton Friedman, were basically given free reign to run the Chilean economy and managed being the absolute, you know, uh, free market devotees that they were to fucking destroy it. So Letelier was, he's not only fighting the regime as an illegitimate military coup, he was also fighting, you know, what we would now call neoliberal capitalism. So of course he had to be assassinated and that was a particularly daring murder because they didn't like wait till Letelier was out of the country or something. They killed Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C., in 1976 and um just to revert briefly to the uh the pinch on stuff the the questions of uh technological control systems and supply lines and so forth there's the interesting sideline to the chilean coup that uh the same way mohammed mossadegh was going to nationalize oil in iran salvador allende was going to nationalize copper in chile that's Chile's main uh, natural resource. And copper, as any of you would know who have any experience with electronics, is ubiquitous in electronics. It's one of the uh, main conductive metals used in every kind of wiring and cabling and so forth. It's since been uh, replaced in computers as a semiconductor by silicon, but I gather even there, you know, finely affiliated copper wire still has some application. So, you know, in the midst of the uh, consumer electronics boom that was secretly a side effect of the nuclear bomb and defense spending, there was no way we were going to let our main copper source dry up. But the main reason that I want you to remember the name David Adley Phillips beyond anything else is that in the early 60s, he was what we would now call the handler uh, what they then called the CIA controller for three CIA assets, three very important people. Antonio Vesiana, who was uh, an anti-Castro Cuban and head of that terrorist group, Alpha 66. Uh, Jimmy Files, who was uh, a former soldier, fairly minor Chicago mafia figure and CIA asset. And we will talk a great deal about Jimmy Files in the future. And number three, and most importantly of all, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, I kind of doubt I'll have the opportunity to go in-depth on Oswald this episode, uh, but I'll tell you just for now, just to, you know, wet your beak, as it were, uh, it is not even a question. It is not a hypothesis. It is, it is not a rumor. Lee Harvey Oswald was CIA. He was CIA from, at the very latest, 1959 onward. Uh, there were, well, should I say that now? Sure, I'll just say that now, just give you a little taste. Um, one of the things that's come out in recent years from the investigation into Kennedy's death is that the Warren Commission held any number of closed-door sessions that were not read into its record. And in one of those closed-door sessions, the CIA was compelled to admit that Oswald had been CIA since at least 1960. And I personally have found information uh, proving that he was CIA quite a bit before that. When I say I personally, I don't mean that I'm the one who dug it up. I mean, I found someone who dug it up. So credit to whatever anonymous internet source that was. We'll get We'll get way more into that. Don't worry about it. But the thing to remember is that Oswald was CIA. His whole defection to Russia story, complete bullshit. He was an embedded agent there. So remember that David Atlee Phillips, the dark fucking presence behind everything that happened in the Western Hemisphere between about 1954 and 1976, and the CIA control agent for Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Let's get to the, the rest of this fun cast, a lot of which falls uh, very neatly into groups of little friends. 
you know, one and two man teams, good cop, bad cop, that kind of thing. So the first group of, you know, real friends, how many of us? That'll be E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis, two of the the great fucking goons in American history. You know, Atlee Phillips was the one who would plan and organize and order uh, these murders and coups. People like Hunt and Sturgis were the ones who would actually get in the field and carry them out. Uh, Howard Hunt, he was involved in Guatemala. He was there for the Bay of Pigs. He attained perhaps his greatest fame for getting arrested uh, for the Watergate burglary, which he did, in fact, commit. And on his deathbed, uh, he confessed to involvement in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And we will get uh, eventually to his confessions. They were, I would say, of not dubious authenticity in the sense that we don't know if he really made them. He did make them, but he was very old and maybe kind of senile. And uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to speculate as to the soundness of his mind. But um, among other things, he indicated the involvement of any number of the people we're about to talk about. And he alleged that uh, LBJ knew about the whole thing. I should say right here and now, I guess, to save you the suspense, I have never seen anything to prove uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Lyndon Johnson knew about the Kennedy assassination before it happened. I can tell you uh, to a certainty, and I'll describe this later, that he knew at the very latest the next day that the official story, the Oswald story, was bullshit. And strictly as a matter of opinion, I can tell you that uh, if if the CIA came to Lyndon Johnson and say mid sixty three and basically told him uh, we're going to kill John Kennedy and you can either be next or you can be our man, if you know anything about Lyndon Johnson, you know his answer is I- I'm your man. <laughs> I mean, I-, I do not claim to have read that mammoth what is it four volume Robert Caro uh, biography of Johnson. I have read enough of it to know that he was a snake oil salesman, son of a bitch who would do absolutely anything for power. Uh, I mean, the guy, when he was like 10 years old, his nickname was Bullshit Johnson. So I don't know whether Johnson knew about the assassination beforehand. I don't have any trouble believing it. I do know that he knew almost immediately afterward that the official story was fake. Uh, Now, Howard Hunt's friend, Frank Sturgis, I mean... Perhaps the goon to end all goons. The funniest thing about Frank Sturgis to me is that uh, Howard Hunt, in addition to uh, being a goon, wrote horrible spy thrillers in which he uh, ridiculously, you know, pompously in horrific purple prose uh, romanticized his own life as, you know, a thug tried to make himself out as fucking James Bond. And this is hilarious because Frank Sturgis's name was not Frank Sturgis. He was born Frank Fiorini. He may have changed his name to Sturgis because the hero of one of Howard Hunt's novels was named Hank Sturgis. So, I mean, that's the kind of super tight bros from way back when we're talking about between these two, right? Um... Sturgis, much like Howard Hunt, uh, Bay of Pigs, uh, Watergate burglary. Uh, He actually worked for Castro during the revolution and then against him after it. This is something that's often forgotten now, but uh, during the Cuban revolution, the United States was not very certain of Fidel Castro's political orientation. We didn't know where he was going to fall, and he seemed to vacillate a little bit himself. So... Any number of CIA and CIA-connected people did favors for both Castro and Fulgencio Batista, the dictator he was trying to topple. Uh, <laughs> one of those people, you know, we'll get to this later. This, this comes up quite a bit later. Uh, just, just so you know now, though, uh, one of the guys who ran guns to both Castro and Batista, uh, a fellow named Jacob Rubenstein, uh, better known as Jack Ruby. 
But back to Frank Sturgis. Uh, after the Watergate burglary, he eventually became a Miami police snitch and confessed involvement in, uh, his words now, assassination plots and conspiracies to overthrow several foreign governments, including Cuba, well, we already know that one, uh, Panama, and that would mean he worked with Manuel Noriega, who was, of course, a CIA asset from the 50s onward. He was the chief of military intelligence under his predecessor, Omar Torrijos, uh, de facto ruler of Panama from 1983 to 1989. And uh, most importantly, he was the CIA point man for gun and, d- gun and drug trafficking throughout Latin America. Um, Sturgis also confessed to involvement in Guatemala. We know all about that by now. Dominican Republic, we know about that. Haiti, which is interesting because um, there was no coup in Haiti during uh, the time period that Sturgis would have been active. I mean, I guess it's possible that he could have participated in the uh, 1991 coup there when uh, baby Doc Duvalier's, you know, basically fascist regime fell apart and he was replaced uh, to our shock, meaning the American shock, by a uh, Catholic leftist named Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Uh, And within six months, Aristide had been kicked out of power by basically the U.S., plus the Haitian right wing. He could have been involved in that, Sturgis, I mean. But he was old by that point, I think in his 70s. So when he talks about Haiti, what he probably means is involvement with the Tonton Makout, um, which just admitting that should have sent him to prison forever. The, of all the death squads that have ever operated in Central and South America and the Caribbean, the Tonton Makout uh, were probably the most horrifying their name means Uncle Gunny Sack because they were named after a, a mythological figure who would show up in the night and put children in a bag and they would disappear. And um, in keeping with the the sort of uh, dark ritual magician image cultivated by uh, François Duvalier or Papa Doc Duvalier, the uh, dictator of Haiti, uh, the Tonto Makut, they all dressed the same. They all, uh, to the extent possible, acted and looked the same. And they were famous for uh, neither killing people nor just disappearing them, but disappearing them briefly and then um, putting their corpses in the tops of trees so that for a couple of days everyone would wonder, hey, uh, where did Jacques go? And then Jacques' dismembered corpse would be in the top of a tree outside your house. So uh, Frank Sturgis probably worked with those guys. He also worked with the Contras in Nicaragua, uh, with the death squads in Honduras, with the uh, right-wing rebels in Angola. And uh, in 1975, I believe to the Miami police, he gave a quote, uh, I smuggled arms and men into Cuba for Castro and against Castro. I broke into intelligence files. I stole and photographed secret documents. That's what spies do. So thanks, Frank. Thanks for making it plain for us. Uh, now let's talk about two, two real good friends, one of whom you probably haven't heard of, the other one of whom you uh, definitely have. And remember now, This is 1959 to 1960 we're talking about. People who were in this shit early. Who was Group 40 back then? George H.W. Bush, who circa 1960 wasn't a politician yet. Uh, In a few years, he would run as a kind of uh, moderate Republican, sort of Rockefeller Republican. And then when that completely failed, he remade himself as a fanatical Goldwater Republican. But... In 1960, he was a multimillionaire oil man uh, working for a subsidiary of Brown Brothers Harriman, which is very, very interesting Uh, because some of you probably know something about George H.W. Bush's father, a guy named Prescott Bush, uh, a horrible piece of shit. Uh, Senator from 1952 to 1962, But before that, he was on the board of directors at Brown Brothers Harriman, which owned his son's oil company. And his job at Brown Brothers Harriman 
was uh, helping Nazis stash their assets in the United States during World War II, uh, most notably Fritz Tyson of the Tyson Krupp Company, uh, most famous now for elevators. Uh, Fritz, of course, major Hitler donor and uh, user of slave labor. And he helped stash money for IG Farben, the, uh, the German dye, you know, chemistry, pharmaceutical uh, firm. And anyone who's read Gravity's Rainbow knows all about IG Farben. Uh, Prescott also was allegedly involved in a little thing called the business plot. Um, there was this feller named General Smedley Butler uh, who wrote a little, I think you'd call it a pamphlet more than a book, called War is a Racket that, that briefly became popular between the two world wars in which he essentially explained that you know, war is not about two sides fighting each other over any question of ideology or borders or what the fuck ever. War is an excuse for people to make money. War is, and Thomas Pynchon again would sum it up years later, War is a celebration of markets. And as Pinchon said, the, the violence is mostly self-policing and can be left to non-professionals. No, the important thing is the celebration of markets. So, and this is all alleged. There's no proof about this. But uh, uh, Smedley Butler, he's a military figure, but he has definite populist and left appeal. He says that in 1933, he was approached by a group of rich men, which included uh, Felix Warburg, or Warburg, of the Warburg Bank family, uh, J.P. Morgan Jr., and Prescott Bush. And they told him they could assemble a fascist army of 500,000 World War I veterans to march against the White House and take the White House on the pretext that Roosevelt was incurably sick and was dying. And they would install Butler uh, with the title Secretary of General Affairs and make him basically a dictator. And they would keep Roosevelt there in a, you know, uh, ceremonial capacity so it wouldn't officially look like a coup, but basically a fascist overthrow of the government. And um, Butler immediately went to the authorities with this because he was not a fascist. And, uh, of course, nothing ever happened. So that's the kind of line that uh, our, our boy, George H.W. Bush, comes from. You know, W fucked up so much more flagrantly, in Iraq especially, that G.H. Dub, uh, he doesn't get nearly the hatred he deserves. This, I mean, head of the CIA, uh, Iran Contra, his horrific fucking presidency, an awful, awful, awful person. And um, worth mentioning, too, that the Harriman in Brown Brothers Harriman was uh, the same family as Avril Harriman, who would, as ambassador, uh, go on to betray JFK horribly in Vietnam at the very beginning of the Vietnam War. But I said we were talking about pairs of friends, right? Well, who's George H.W. Bush's friend? Uh, I, the, the mystery man, Orlando Bosch, uh, an exiled Cuban dissident who, of course, hated Castro, uh, involved in Operation Condor, the massive Central and South American CIA campaign that I told you about last time. Uh, it is rumored that he is the guy who personally murdered Orlando Letelier in 1976, uh, killed at least 73 people bombing a Cuban airliner that same year and may have been involved in other airliner bombings. And uh, he took off to Costa Rica after that airliner bombing. And Costa Rica called up George H.W. Bush, then the head of the CIA, and said, hey, we can extradite this guy to you because um, Bush had lived in the United States, I believe in Toledo, Ohio, uh, for long enough that he had gained if not official citizenship, then, you know, permanent resident alien status or something like that. So they called the head of the CIA, who was Bush, and said, yeah, we'll send you this guy who killed 70, 73 people by blowing up an airplane. And Bush said, no, nah, that's okay. We don't need him. 
Uh, so Bush spent the rest of the 70s and 80s kind of island hopping in the Caribbean, uh, looking for nations that would take him in and then uh, escaping when it looked like they were finally going to extradite him. And then in 1990, George H.W. Bush, by that point the president, came out and openly said, hey, Orlando Bush, he can come here. We will not prosecute him. And so Orlando Bush returned to his <laughs> adoptive home and never suffered any consequences for the murder of at least 73 civilians. Of course, for him, his alibi for the bombing is that you see, you don't understand. There's no such thing as a civilian Cuban plane. Every Cuban plane is secretly a military plane. So I killed, I killed 73 secret members of the military. And apparently, uh, George H.W. Bush agreed. And now, uh, True Friends, part three. Uh, Porter Goss and Ted Shackley. Some of you may remember the name Porter Goss, first of all, for being just one of the most intolerably fucking New England dipshit names in the world. And second of all, for uh, having been CIA director briefly in the early 2000s. I'll explain what happened there. But Porter Goss was at this meeting uh, for something completely different. You see, the, the very first fixation of Group 40... And the very first fixation of all all the uh, operations grouped under the Operation 40 umbrella was Castro. You know, they eventually turned to Kennedy when it became clear that Kennedy was going to make peace with Castro. So Porter Goss uh, got the assignment of working at a thing called JM Wave. That's JM slash Wave, which was a project in Miami. Uh, that worked under the front Zenith Technical Services. Uh, enormous fucking enterprise. It took up six buildings on the campus of the University of Miami. So if you ever wonder about, you know, things like academic complicity with the CIA, well, there you fucking go. And Zenith Technical Services, or JM Wave, it, uh, it did all kinds of different things. It ran people secretly in and out of Cuba. It ran a CIA radio station that illegally broadcasted into Cuba. It uh, had, at one point, the third largest fleet in the Caribbean after the U.S. and Cuba. Um, in 2017 dollars, its annual budget would be $435 million. Uh, between three and 400 employees at any given time. Largest CIA station outside Langley, Virginia. So Porter Goss, you know, he was the dude. He was running the CIA's fucking Ritz-Carlton when it came to anti-Castro operations. And uh, safe to assume he had some role then in uh, the Bay of Pigs and possibly Alpha 66. And after the Bay of Pigs, um, all kinds of uh, anti-Castro operations, usually ones not approved by the president, usually illegal ones, were grouped under the name Operation Mongoose. So if I say Operation Mongoose, that's just general anti-Castro shit. Now, Porter served out his time, loyal soldier, and he was named the uh, director of the CIA, or technically I believe the director of central intelligence, different job title, uh, but the same job. It's just they called it a different thing then. In 2004, and he only lasted until 2006. And if you read, you know, the sort of Newsweek level versions of these events, what you will see is that Porter Goss quit the CIA over disagreements with Bush and the uh, Oval Office over how to use the CIA in Iraq. And maybe they did have such disagreements. That's not impossible. Uh, that's not why Porter Goss had to quit. Porter Goss had to quit because the Mexican police found a CIA plane loaded with five and a half tons of cocaine. Uh, a plane that was incidentally jointly registered in terms of ownership to a CIA front company and to the Saudi royal family. 
that's why Porter Goss ceased to be CIA chief. And that brings us to a, a very important point, the CIA and drugs. You know, I think Iran Contra is probably what most people think of when they think of the CIA and drugs. But the CIA has been, and no doubt is still, using drugs to finance off-books operations forever. Um, the whole anti-Castro period from 1959 to, uh, well, up to Kennedy's assassination, probably beyond that, but that's the period I know about for sure. Uh, the CIA had a poppy plantation in Mexico, and they were running heroin across the border to finance uh, secret training camps for anti-Castro guerrillas. Uh, they uh, <laughs> collaborated with the Sinaloa cartel in Mexico and El Chapo. They brought back an unbelievable shitload of heroin from uh, what's called the Golden Triangle, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. This is part of the reason they were so adamant that the Vietnam War shouldn't end. And uh, we'll get to this a little bit later, but uh, they financed most of their operations in Laos by selling heroin. And uh, interesting, interesting modern development that you probably know that El Chapo is in jail in New York State right now and awaiting trial. Well, he's gotten out of jail twice before and neither time was a fucking accident. The first time, in fact, he literally just paid Vicente Fox, the president of Mexico, uh, $9 million to get out of jail. And it wasn't just corruption. It's also that no one wants El Chapo testifying because he knows so much fucking dirt about so many governments, particularly the American and Mexican governments. We don't want him on the stand. Um, I personally would be kind of shocked if he testifies at any point. I'm guessing he's either going to accept a plea deal or he's going to get murdered in prison before he ever has a trial. And um, normally I wouldn't mention something like a celebrity blind item, but with the horrors coming out of Hollywood lately, uh, particularly regarding uh, institutional systematic pedophilia and child abuse, I would be remiss not to mention that uh, certain blind item dumps have had all this stuff perfectly accurately uh, months and sometimes even years before it was announced. And I bring this up because one of those blind item dumps is reporting that uh, El Chapo's wife, uh, I believe her name is Emma Coronel Aispuro, has been having uh, low-key meetings with Huma Abedin, the uh, now, I believe, ex-wife of Anthony Weiner, but more importantly, number one personal aide to Hillary Clinton. And I'm guessing what Emma and Huma are discussing is the fact that uh, El Chapo had a deal with the American government from the early 90s until just the last few years in which he was allowed to operate the Sinaloa cartel with impunity as long as he would help us destroy the other cartels. Uh, they're, they're probably hard at work trying to figure out uh, how to square that one. Uh, back to the true friends, part three. Who was Porter Goss's friend? Mr. Ted Shackley, chief of the Miami CIA station, guy who ran the secret war in Laos from 1966 onward, meaning he sold a shitload of heroin. Um, hey, it's Chile again. Uh, Shackley attempted to block Allende's election in 1970 uh, with a bizarre plot to fuck up the Chilean economy and, uh, inst or rather inspire than institute, uh, instigate, I should say, a military coup. I believe it was he and International Telephone and Telegraph or something like that. Um, that didn't work, but, you know, they got their man a few years later, so everything's okay. And then he succeeded David Atlee Phillips, ding, ding, as Chief of Western Hemisphere Operations uh, in 1972, moved up to Deputy Director of Covert Operations in 1976, but tragically uh, was forced out in 1979 after uh, someone 
ex uh, exposed his involvement in an arms deal with Muammar Gaddafi that involved, among other things, him selling 20 tons of C4 explosive to Gaddafi. Uh, and, and that was the fate of Mr. Ted Shackley. And finally, uh, our last pair of friends, uh, Antonio Vesiana and David Sanchez Morales. Uh, Antonio Vesiana was, as I mentioned, under David Atlee Phillips, the head of the Alpha 66 group that performed illegal terrorist raids on the Cuban coast after the Bay of Pigs. Um, he is important less for that than for his testimony. Because in 1976, he went before the House Select Committee on Assassinations and was asked about David Atlee Phillips and said, I don't know any David Atlee Phillips. I just know Frank Bishop. I can't, I don't know any ties between the two men. Frank Bishop was the only guy I know. I think because he thought this would save him. Um, three years later, he caught a bullet in the side of the head in a drive-by shooting, but managed to survive. And in 2014, uh, came out and said, yeah, I was fucking lying. Frank Bishop was, uh, Frank Bishop was David Atlee Phillips. And not only is that true, but, um, I personally saw David Atlee Phillips meeting with Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas, late August or early September, 1963. And Vesiana's buddy, a guy named David Sanchez Morales, uh, Bay of Pigs, of course, uh, J.M. Wave, of course, CIA Warren Lau, of course, Allende, of course. Um, this is still kind of a matter of conjecture, but there is a photo of Bobby Kennedy's assassination that appears to show David Sanchez Morales in the background. And... Um, he finally agreed to testify to the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978 uh, and then just a few days before it had a heart attack out of nowhere and uh, no autopsy on that one. So naturally, you know, we can just put this to bed. And now the, the last few figures from this, uh, this Group 40 hit list. You know, most of the time people say murderers row. They're speaking figuratively. This is a, an actual row of murderers. Um, Barry Seal was probably there. Uh, CIA pilot ran drugs. Uh, definitely part of the Iran Contra, probably part of other drug running schemes. And uh, was murdered in 1988, suspiciously right after... Uh, threatening George H.W. Bush by saying he would talk about CIA stuff if Bush wouldn't help him get the IRS off his back. And then a figure I wanted to end this list with because he's a very important liaison, uh, a, an interface between two worlds, uh, William Kang Harvey, the man they called the American James Bond. Now, if you look up a photo of William King Harvey, it is painfully obvious that he gave himself that nickname because nobody else thought that motherfucker looked like the American James Bond. Uh, but he was part of the Bay of Pigs. He was part of Operation Mongoose. Uh, he was uh, there for Operation Gladio, so he was old-time CIA. Um, was part of a bizarre plan, a code name PB Jointly, to dig a secret tunnel from west to east Berlin. <laughs> that we could use to get into the Soviet Union. Um, but the two most important things about uh, William King Harvey are this. Number one, after Operation Mongoose was discovered and routed out, um, Harvey was reassigned partly because of uh, Mongoose and partly because he was a terrible drunk to the CIA station in Rome where he did not want to go. And I can't tell you if this story is true. I can only tell you that I've heard it several times. Supposedly, the night before Kennedy got killed, uh, so that would be November 21st, 63, Harvey went out drinking, threw an all-night raging drunk, came in the next day, hadn't slept, uh, same clothes, still shit-faced, 
And one of his underlings said to him, you know, geez, boss, are you sure you don't want to go home and sleep this one off? And Harvey said, I can't go home today. Today's the day we kill the president. <laughs> the other important thing about William King Harvey is that he was the CIA's main link to the mafia, specifically Sam Giancana, Johnny Rosselli, Santos Traficante, and Robert Mayhew. And when I talked in the first episode about the fact that the CIA is in some ways basically a contracting organization, one of its biggest contractors is the mafia. Um, I will get back to some of the history of this uh, in the episodes on Oswald and the killing itself, but Meyer Lansky, uh, some of you might know, big time Florida mafioso, he told an employee of his that we, meaning organized crime, had been in bed with them, meaning the OSS and then the CIA, since 1944. Uh, the CIA and the, the mafia have been collaborating on things for the entire existence of the CIA. They use the mafia as hitmen. And in this specific case, anti-Cuba shit, the mafia was very, very, very interested indeed. Uh, particularly Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante. Giancana was the, the boss in Chicago. Uh, his nickname was Momo. And Traficante was the king of the, I believe, the Tampa, Florida mob, one of the Florida mobs. And up until Fidel Castro... They were also the kings of the casino racket in Havana. Uh, adjusted to 2018 dollars, the two of them were making about 4.25 million dollars every day on their casinos in Cuba. So they really wanted that shit back. And uh, incidentally, various mafia members, especially Giancana Traficante, uh, Johnny Rosselli and Carlos Marcello, who will come up quite a bit later, uh, they poured a lot of money into JFK's campaign uh, for three reasons. Basically because uh, JFK's dad had old mafia ties, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, because they were sure JFK would invade Cuba and get them their shit back, and because uh, they thought if John were president, he would put Bobby Kennedy on a leash. Bobby Kennedy had been hassling all of their asses uh, with a thing called the Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor Management, better known as the McClellan Committee. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was a special counsel on that. And his, uh, his main point of interest was going after Jimmy Hoffa, the head of the Teamsters Union, because he thought correctly that uh, Jimmy Hoffa was using the Teamsters pension funds to run an enormous mafia slush fund. So they thought, you know, fuck it, elect Johnny, he'll tell Bobby to, to cool it down. And, of course, one of John's first actions was to appoint Bobby uh, attorney general, which they were very fucking unhappy with. And one of the very first things Bobby did was to deport Carlos Marcello. I've mentioned him a couple of times now. Let me explain the guy. He was the uh, boss of the New Orleans Mafia in the late 50s, early 60s. And he had these problems with immigration, you see. Uh, he was born Calogero Minacore to Sicilian parents in Tunisia. But he faked a Guatemalan passport to get into the United States. So on April 4th, 1961, Bobby deported him to Guatemala. Um, two months later, he's back hiding out in New Orleans, uh, allegedly flown there by a guy named David Ferry. And when we get to the Oswald shit, oh boy, there's going to be a lot to say about David Ferry. One of the weirdest motherfuckers in the history of the world. Um, Marcello also had longtime connections in the Dallas mafia, including, uh, Jack Ruby, uh, he had a lieutenant there named uh, Joseph Campisi. And incidentally, Joseph Campisi's restaurant is good as hell. Campisi's Egyptian. 
go there if you're ever in Dallas. Sit where Jack Ruby sat. Um, talking David Ferry, I mentioned weird motherfuckers. Let's finish this Group 40 list off with another weird motherfucker, a guy named Robert Mayhew. Uh, Robert Mayhew was originally a lawyer who got hired and put on retainer by Howard Hughes, uh, who will come up quite a bit in this story as well. And eventually he came to be the man that Hughes trusted the most. And when Hughes from, I believe, 52 or 53 onward, entered the final phase of his life where he would, well, long final phase, final phase with many sub phases, but a uh, final in the sense that he never showed himself publicly again. Robert Mayhew became his public face. Robert Mayhew was the guy who would go to the galas and, you know, the openings and the uh, the speeches, the, po the political conventions, blah, blah, blah. Robert Mayhew, for all purposes, was Howard Hughes out in the world. He was also, however, CIA connected. One of his clients as a lawyer, uh, had been the CIA. And when Hughes put him on an exclusive retainer, he became a CIA asset. And Mayhew was the guy who brokered the first meeting in 1960 between the CIA and Momo Giancana, Sam Giancana, over, uh, a plot to murder Fidel Castro and take back Cuba. And we can say with some certainty, given uh, the people involved, that William King Harvey was probably his CIA link there. So all of these people I've just mentioned, they begin as the nucleus of the group to kill Castro and reinvade Cuba. They end, well, actually they don't end at all, but <laughs> they transform into the nucleus of the group that murdered John Kennedy once it be becomes clear that John Kennedy is not going to acquiesce to their Cuba plans. So let's talk about John Kennedy. It's taken a while to get to him. Um, I don't want to go too far into the whole Kennedy legend. I mean, fuck all that. I do think, though, it's important to emphasize what kind of background John Kennedy came from. Because the impression around his dad, Joe Kennedy, as I always heard it, you know, growing up, was that he was a businessman with some kind of, you know, slightly seedy connections, but, you know, ultimately a powerful and respected member of high society and so forth. I mean, that's kind of true. Um, he was also an enormous piece of shit. Uh, he made his above board money in stock speculation and then real estate, and then steel, and then uh, importing and exporting liquor, and then in refinancing movie studios. Uh, one of those movie studios was RKO, which was at the time majority owned by Howard Hughes, uh, and they came to hate each other. Uh, the not above board stuff, the under the table stuff, uh, he was a bootlegger, he had profound mafia connections, and the most repulsive thing I've heard about him is that uh, one of the ways he quote unquote refinanced RKO was by uh, smuggling Mexicans over the California border to scab to build uh, sets at non-union rates. And then he would have the men reported to immigration and sent back to Mexico or put in jail and have the women sold into prostitution. So he was, I mean, literally a slaver. Uh, he, he was a, an awful person. This, this wasn't, you know, some mere like, oh, he's, he's, he's got some friends. I don't know about that. You know, th this was not seediness. This was being a fucking human trafficker. And um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt made the big fucking mistake of appointing him secretary to, I'm sorry, not secretary, ambassador to Great Britain in 1938 because uh, Joe Kennedy was working in the steel industry at the same time that Franklin Roosevelt was, I believe, Secretary of the Navy. And obviously the Navy buys a lot of steel, so they got to be friends. He gives him this job, Ambassador to St. James Court, uh, 1938 to 1940, during which Joe Kennedy distinguishes himself uh, primarily by saying almost exclusively positive stuff about Hitler. 
And once the Nazis started attacking uh, Britain, Kennedy wrote back to Roosevelt, well, that's it for democracy in the UK. And uh, he was perfectly happy to have fascism take over England. So uh, he lost that job. And there is, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but there, there's an interesting sort of Cain and Abel thing um, between Joe Kennedy and Howard Hughes in that they were both from well-to-do but not super rich families. And they both, you know, took that that seed money and became unfathomably wealthy. I mean, everyone knows how rich Howard Hughes was, but I didn't know, certainly. Uh, I don't think most people know that by the modern value of a dollar, Joe Kennedy was a billionaire. He was incredibly rich. Uh, so you would have thought perhaps that they would, uh, they would get along. They would see, each would see something of himself in the other. But Howard Hughes was a Southern wasp of the most uh, uh, unblemished bloodline. And Joe Kennedy, of course, was a, a dirty Boston Irishman, grasping, climbing the social ladder. Um, and I have to think that Hughes saw something of his, his mirror image in, in Kennedy in that, uh, you know, Hughes's outward persona was all Jet engines and jet planes and movie stars and movie premieres. It you know was the the ultimate sort of uh, rich high society, uh, extremely clean, extremely manicured image. And Joe Kennedy was deep in dirt, and everybody fucking knew it, but nobody could do anything about it. And then, of course, when it came to the uh, the actual politics of the thing, Joe Kennedy was the man who masterminded John Kennedy's presidential campaign and Howard Hughes fought like hell to make Richard Nixon the president in 1960 because he fucking owned Nixon um that's a story I'll tell later when it comes to the the actual election why he owned Nixon but the idea of a Kennedy in the White House was the most disgusting thing he could possibly imagine uh and uh Howard Hughes also was phenomenally racist like racist to an almost unbelievable degree uh he didn't say this kind of thing in public of course but he was a firm proponent of the idea that we should reintroduce slavery in the united states um so the fact that kennedy you know made nice with civil rights groups i mean nothing could have revolted him more so speaking of kennedy that'll be john kennedy where did this fucking guy come from, you know, in terms of his politics? Uh, the guy that made himself eventually dangerous enough to be murdered. That's a difficult question to answer. Well, it's both difficult and simple. Simple in that, you know, a couple clear events made it happen. Difficult in that um, it really doesn't square with the rest of his life very well at all. Because for most of his political career, JFK was the exact sort of center-right, war hawk, liberal mediocrity who would be perfectly at home in the modern Democratic Party, uh, as would Richard Nixon, for that matter. Their politics were not that appreciably different in the early days. Uh, now, Kennedy, of course, before he was a politician had the advantage of being a war hero, the famous PT-109 incident. We see he was in the Naval Reserve, uh, August 1943. He was um, in charge of a patrol torpedo boat, uh, was patrolling New Georgia in the Solomon Islands. The boat got rammed. It broke in half. He uh, personally towed a badly burned unconscious crew member to a nearby island by putting the belt of the guy's life jacket between his teeth and swimming, and then had to tow the guy the same way to another island when it became clear that no one was going to uh, uh, rescue them there. And only a few months later, you know, gets out of the hospital quickly, and in November 43, uh, commanded another patrol torpedo boat, PT-59, that rescued 87 Marines stranded on uh, what I'm guessing is pronounced Choi Sul Island, also in the Solomons. Uh, there are certain military historian types 
who will tell you that PT-109 was an enormous fuck-up, that Kennedy should have been court-martialed over it because his boat never should have been there in the first place. Uh, that may be true. I don't know. I don't pretend to know nearly enough about military tactics to tell you if he was right on that account. But the fact remains that he did, you know, save a number of people's lives. So that in itself was uh, more than enough for him to run for Congress in 1946 and to win. And as a congressman, he was uh, a complete fucking mediocrity. He was a, an absolute supporter of the Truman Doctrine, that, you know, all kinds of aggression in foreign countries was totally justified uh, insofar as it would help us stop the spread of demonic communism. He was in favor of the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, which helped weaken labor power. He was in favor of, Jesus Christ, the Immigration of Nationality Act in 1952, in which communists would have to register with the federal government. Um, the only good thing he did as a congressman, as far as I can tell, was go on one of those little learning visits um, to what was then French Indochina uh, and would now be called Vietnam. He and Bobby went along. And uh, this was a little while before the first Indochinese War, before the Viet Minh uh, started fighting the French. So, you know, they, they knew to look at this place in terms of a possible uh, military venue. And both JFK and RFK decided in 1951 it would be fucking suicide to fight a war here in this terrain against these people to try to come and occupy this place and what subdue them and just stay forever that's fucking lunacy never ever fight a war in vietnam so he had this in mind from 1951 on then of course having done his uh, six years as congressman uh becomes a senator in 1952 and, again, is a total mediocrity as a senator. He, um, if you look at the historical record, officially he voted yes on the 1957 Civil Rights Bill. Uh, what that doesn't tell you is that that was the second version of the 1957 Civil Rights Bill. The reason there needed to be a second version is that a number of people, including John Kennedy, had helped gut the first and much stronger version. Um, I don't completely understand the legislative mechanics of this thing, but as I understand it, uh, the vote came up for the first version of the much stronger civil rights bill, and Kennedy cast a procedural vote that would allow the Senate to split the bill up into its constituent uh, titles or articles. So that, you know, you could vote for part one and part four and none of the rest, which, you know, completely destroyed the unity of purpose of the bill. So then they had to write another one, much weaker one, that only incorporated the things that had, had garnered enough votes in this splitting up. And Kennedy voted yes on that. So, I mean, just fucking cowardice. And um, the Kennedys were also very tight with McCarthy. And though JFK uh, drafted a speech supporting the censure of McCarthy after the, you know, Army McCarthy hearings and all that, he never delivered that speech. Uh, he managed to be indisposed on the day when he was supposed to give it, and he never voted on the censure. And in fact, uh, Bobby Kennedy's first job was uh, serving for seven months as assistant counsel to McCarthy on the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Although, to Bobby's credit, he later helped fuck McCarthy and Roy Cohn in the Army McCarthy hearings. So, you know, Bobby made good on that. Um, my impression of Bobby, just incidentally, is that he was much firmer in his convictions. Bobby was the fucking Catholic Avenger. You know, Bobby was out there to... Uh, destroy people who fucked around in ways that he didn't like. Uh, as I say, I mean, as I think his record demonstrates, John was just your absolute bog standard, slightly to the right of the middle of the road mediocrity. Um, but goddamn, did he have profile? 
thanks to uh, the PT-109 Fang, and thanks to his dad, and thanks to uh, a couple things uh, he did media-wise during his uh, senatorial tenure. Uh, a book in 1957 called Profiles and Courage that won the Pulitzer Prize for biography. You notice I don't say he wrote a book because he didn't write the book. The book was written almost entirely by Ted Sorensen, his speechwriter, but, you know, who fucking cared? Um, he, so he wins the Pulitzer Prize. He becomes the senator with the Pulitzer. And then someone makes a, you know, day-in-the-life propaganda film for him called the The U.S. Senator John F. Kennedy Story, 1958. Um, and... You know, he's he's got all this shine. He's hot. People want a piece of him. And he becomes a clear candidate for the 1960 uh, Democratic nomination, particularly against Richard Nixon, who, in terms of image, is just absolutely everything that Kennedy is not in the bad way. Um, and let's not forget, you know, everybody talks about those Nixon-Kennedy debates, you know, the famous story that people who saw them on TV thought Kennedy won and people who heard them on the radio thought it was a draw or that Nixon had won. Um, the thing to me that's important about those debates is that Kennedy ran to the right of Nixon on national defense, which is to say basically on making war, particularly the Cold War on this thing called the missile gap, the allegation that we were, you know, lagging behind the communist powers in terms of our development of a nuclear arsenal. And um, that was just complete bullshit. Uh, I don't know if Kennedy knew that it was bullshit at the time. The people who wrote it knew that it was bullshit. But he managed to flummox Nixon with it. And, of course, Nixon was, I mean a guy you wouldn't buy a car from. I'm, whenever I think of Richard Nixon, I think of um, uh, Hunter Thompson writing about his, his, uh, his, rather I should say, Hunter Thompson writing Nixon's obituary and saying um, <laughs> he was so crooked he had to screw his pants on. Even his funeral was illegal. He should have been buried in a dumpster. Like, Nixon was just the most flagrantly fucking slimeball piece of shit in American politics. You could argue that there were people who had way worse politics than Nixon did. And as I have not failed to mention on this show before, Nixon's politics, as repulsive as it is to say this, are uh, in many ways considerably to the left of your average Democrat in 2018. Uh, but Kennedy... You know, he had that fucking glow. He had that charisma. Uh, you listen to the Watergate tapes years later, and Nixon is still obsessed with the fact that he, he just didn't have that, that goddamn fucking star power that that goddamn fucking Jack Kennedy had. And I think uh, if you could get people to be absolutely honest, I think a lot of people would tell you they voted for Kennedy not because of any particular, you know, conviction, or certainly not because of any particular policy, but just because they felt like it meant something. Because he gestured vaguely in the direction of youth and change and progress without, you know, being very concrete as to what any of that meant. Um, having seen almost exactly the same thing with Obama, I feel like I've got a pretty good sense of it. And there was also the Howard Hughes thing I mentioned earlier, it came out during that campaign, and this is a hilarious thing, both because it's funny in itself and because it's funny that of all the ways for Richard Nixon to go down, he should go down this way, that in 1956, Howard Hughes uh, was facing uh, trouble from the IRS and trouble from his stockholders and takeover attempts at his various companies. So he had the idea to start a charitable foundation called the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute that was pretty plainly a fraud and then gift all of his stock in the Hughes Airplane Company to this charitable corporation, which would mean that um, all the earnings on that stock would be tax-free. You know, it's a charity. 
and that Hughes Airplane would become the tax-exempt subsidiary of a charity owned by Howard Hughes. Um, to make this happen, he needed the IRS to certify the Medical Institute as a tax-exempt charitable organization, even though it was obviously fake. So Hughes took a look around him and thought, you know, who seems bribable? And looked at Richard Nixon and thought, oh yeah, that guy's bribable. So he sniffed around the Nixons a little bit, trying to figure out what, what Richard would appreciate, and found that Richard's brother Don was trying to cash in on Richard's political fame by starting a fast food franchise called, I shit you not, Nixon Burger. He was going to have Nixon Burgers all up and down the California coast, baby. So Howard Hughes gave uh, Don Nixon uh, $200,000, which, if my math is right, is uh, like $1.6 million or something like that in modern money to start Nixon Burger. And the burger chain completely failed. Uh, I mean, who wants to associate Richard Nixon with eating? Uh, but as soon as uh, Eisenhower and Nixon got reelected in late 56, bing, bang, boom, the charitable certification for the Hughes Institute comes through. So someone passed that info to the JFK campaign and it came out and, you know, every... Uh, Every suspicion you'd ever had about Richard Nixon, uh, just from looking at him, was completely confirmed. So Kennedy wins. Uh, he wins pretty narrowly, and he wins with a lot of help from the mafia, from Sam Giancana, from Carlos Marcello, from Johnny Rosselli, from Santo Traficante in particular, especially in uh, Illinois and West Virginia. And... Then we got to go back to something I mentioned earlier, the CIA's murder of Patrice Lumumba. Um, uh, Lumumba, some of you will know, he was the main impetus behind uh, the Congolese independence from Belgium, behind the, the Congo's recognition as its own state. Uh, big proponent of you know the political philosophy that came to be called Pan-Africanism. Uh, first prime minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So naturally, naturally, Alan Dulles uh, personally described Lumumba's assassination as, I quote, urgent and prime objective. Uh, and the CIA uh, spent about six months trying to kill him. Uh, Eisenhower ordered them in September 1960 to kill Lumumba with poison toothpaste, which didn't work. But in December 1960, the CIA station chief in Elisabethville uh, helped the, uh, the allies of Mobutu Sese Seko, who was Lumumba's main political challenger, uh, find Lumumba. And Mobutu, of course, would go on to be the autocrat of the Congo from 1965 to 1997 and would become the, you know, the archetype of the kleptocrat. So with the CIA's help, Mobutu Sese Seko's people put Lumumba in prison in uh, December 1960. And then on January 17, 1961, uh, they kill Lumumba again with the CIA's help. In fact, um, they put Lumumba's corpse in the trunk of a CIA agent's car. What you may remember about that date, January 17, 1961, is that it was the day fucking Eisenhower gave the fucking military-industrial complex speech. And it was also uh, three days before Kennedy's inauguration. And Kennedy, on the campaign trail, had let slip that... Uh, this, would, this would be after he had already won, but before he'd been inaugurated, that he thought the way Lumumba was being treated... Uh, was unfair and unwise and that, you know, he didn't know whether or not the Congolese people wanted Lumumba to be their president, but certainly the man shouldn't be in jail. So the CIA had him killed, specifically as a fucking warning to John Kennedy. And uh, I think that is a decent place to leave it for now. now. Now that you know the cast of Group 40, the kind of things they were involved in, 
the sort of political nullity John Kennedy was for uh, for most of his life, and the kind of opposition from his own government he was facing by the time he became president. And next time, I'm going to tell you about the two things that transformed John Kennedy. And we talk about, you know, personal transformation and rebirth all the time. And it's mostly new age bullshit or fodder for, you know, celebrity rehab TV shows. But John Kennedy truly was a different person over the last year and a half or so of his life. Uh, The best evidence for which is that he was murdered for it. Because John Kennedy saw that he did not run his own government that the state was at the mercy of forces nobody elected and nobody could punish, much less control. So he, like I said, he he laid down on the tracks, knowing full well what was going to happen. Uh, next time, I'll tell you how and why, and I hope, I hope there will be time in that same episode to uh, get into another central mystery who the fuck was Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, as I've already told you, a CIA agent. <laughs> Not just any CIA agent, though. Uh, a special one, one with a remarkably convoluted career. And one who, uh, just to, you know, not to leave you hanging, yes, was absolutely involved in the Kennedy assassination. No, did not assassinate John Kennedy. And yes, was a patsy. Oswald helped arrange for the assassination. He was a key player in it. And he realized way too late, holy shit, they're going to need to string somebody up for this. And I get the feeling that it's me. So keep that all in mind. And until next time, friends, lovers, Roman lovers, remember, Death is just around the corner.